All right, guys, welcome back to the weekly Q&A. If you have any questions, post them down below and let's begin. Would it be a good idea to gain work capacity before starting a weightlifting program? For instance, would it be a good idea to make it a goal to be able to run a 5K before starting a novice program? I would have to say no. No matter what your experience level is right now, if you jump in the program straight on, you will recover and make gains workout to workout. May not be easy initially, and I'll be the first to admit that a former athlete who has zero weight training experience will probably make faster progress than you. But still, it's not about what others do. I'm not going to tell you to spend a few months developing your work capacity with cardiovascular work or doing some other sport or just trying to get a 5K in general. I don't know what your starting point is. If you're obese, for example, that can take a super long time. All I will say is that it's ideal. That would be the best possible case scenario. Heck, maybe even doing one month of calisthenics before getting into it. That's a good idea. It's certainly not a bad idea. But that you're somehow going to compromise your gains as a result of coming into the system without having the right work capacity? No, you're still going to get amazing progress, workout to workout. And after three months, you're going to have some very decent numbers. So the fact that everything's going to be all right to begin with makes me not even have to recommend this in the first place. So it's up to you if you want to go down that path. Some would call it a sacrifice. Others would say it's more beneficial in the long run because you have more of that base. But how long is it going to take to get that cardiovascular and work capacity base? Probably a lot longer than you realize. For that reason alone, can't say it's the best idea. Unless you actually have, say, calisthenics goals. You spend a full year doing it because you actually care about it. And then you jump into weighted calisthenics. You're able to rep out 45 pounds in the pull-ups. Your dips are pretty good too. And now your bench is already in the hundreds instead of starting off with empty bar. So I would say that's more so beneficial than trying to be a runner. Though, people who have track and field experience, marathon running experience, anyone who was a former athlete will make better gains in the program, hands down. But again, you're not going to get that work capacity right off the bat if you're brand new to lifting altogether. So the smartest thing is just go into the program, headstrong, man it up. Yeah, it's going to hurt. The first two weeks, you're going to be especially sore, but everything will develop adequately. And worst case, you can always include cardio on the off days or at the end of the workout. No reason to skip out the most important aspect just to specialize and develop your work capacity. That's going to come. It's all in due time. My floor press one or max is higher than my flat bench press touch and go. Why is this? Nine out of 10 times it's due to leverages. In my case, it's the complete opposite. No amount of floor pressing or specific training can ever correct this imbalance. Even if I do nothing but that, the moment I go do any flat bench, I can put up more numbers because it's correcting my weaknesses and the leverages are more difficult. I have pretty short arms, so I can get pretty close to touching my chest. And it basically represents a full range of motion box squat of bench pressing. So the fact that you're breaking up the eccentric concentric chain makes it more difficult by default. But in your case, you probably have such long arms that when you do the floor press, it becomes this partial lift. You're so far off from your chest that you can lock it out no problem. And that's why you're able to lift more. It'll probably always be that way for you. Some people, it's about the same. Others, a little bit higher. Others, it's absolute garbage, like in the case of your boy. I cannot fix this under any circumstances. Give me the best strength coach in the world. My floor press will always be weaker than my touch and go regular. It's just the way it is. So that's why I'm saying most times, has everything to do with leverages, and that's why it doesn't matter whatsoever. If you're already doing the variations, you know what the comparisons are. It's not about being equal across all your lifts. It's about doing them all and straining and using the correct percentages. So the fact that it's stronger, so what? If you're doing a one rep max and you can lift 30 pounds more, it's still a one rep max, and that's gonna give you carryover and make you a better lifter. So I wouldn't worry about that ratio. Hey, Alex, you talked a lot about weighted stretching, especially in the traps. Do you think the same method can be used for calf gains? Absolutely. In fact, most guys are doing partial repetitions with their calf raises, which is compromising their results. They're just doing little movements at the ankle. You want to get a full stretch. Hence why standing on top of a block is recommended. Don't just do barbell calf raises like this, touching the ground. You're not getting that optimal way to stretch. It's full range of motion according to this movement, which automatically has the weight of stretching component built in. And there have been other methods in the past that include the weight of stretch as a mandatory feature like dog crab training. After getting some rep work in, you put on even heavier load and just stretch out those calves. Some people say it works, others say it doesn't. I haven't tried that myself because I don't really care. But I will say that there are some studies on weight of stretching for calves. I think there was one that came out a few years back, maybe 2016, 2017, I don't recall the exact date. But 
You had guys who were just stretching out their calves on the leg press and they grew through nothing more than the stretch. So yeah, it works for all the other body parts. Why not the calf raise, especially since you need to do the full range of motion to optimize the results and are stubborn in the first place. It would make sense to get that effect going on. Alex, what's your advice on dealing with joint pain? Should I stop training completely or train around it? Also, how can I prevent joint pain in the future? Love your videos. Keep up the work, man. Well, thank you, brother. I would say it's a bit of everything. For example, your shoulders are achy when doing the classical bench press, but you're still able to press fine with the Swiss bar. Use that. Doesn't mean you need to max out for that session. It could be working up to a training max, just stopping at 90%. And then when you do your back off work, you can use a slightly lower percentage, treat it as a slight deload day. It's better to get a workout in and do nothing at all, unless you're really on the verge of snap city, but it shouldn't come to that point to begin with. Your body will give you the signs. Let's say your elbows and shoulders are bothering you when you do pull-ups, but performing a barbell row causes no issues whatsoever. Do those instead. Perform the exercises that yield no pain and disregard the ones that are causing the issues. Heck, it could be dropping the isolation work for that session. Maybe your elbows are a bit achy from the extensions. Don't do them. Perform a tricep push down instead or just do the compounds and call it a day. You don't have to hit your maximum recoverable volume for every single session. It can vary a bit depending how you're feeling. But again, it shouldn't come to that point to begin with. And then to answer your final question, which kind of ties everything together, the secret to preventing injuries is by maximizing your program. Minimalism is how you develop overuse injuries, which is number one. That's what gets people snapped up. It's not the heavy lifting. It's not necessarily the bad form either, even though that's a massive contributing factor. It's the repetitive strain doing the same exact movement patterns, not mixing things up. Like people say, oh, you're fine if you do the same exercise year round from a muscle gaining standpoint, because volume's volume. If you're hitting failure, you're good to go. That's true. But what they completely ignore is the overuse aspect of this, which is why minimalists are getting hurt on a consistent basis. They don't have the same longevity as those who do a little bit more of the stuff. So that's the main thing. And also check out my injury prevention playlist, man. How strong should I be to start using bands? Should I reach your novice standards first? How strong were you when you started the training with bands? And what do you recommend when someone should start using bands? Thanks for so much great content. Well, thank you, sir. I would say you should wait till you're an intermediate lifter because novices will be fine with the basic compound movements and the variations that those entail, like the pause bench, close grip bench, front squats, stiff legged like deadlift, like it's so simple to gain muscle as a novice. You'll never have a time frame like this ever again in your entire life. Milk it. It's the easiest gains ever. Literally, I mean this when I say this. So why would you include all these variations when you don't need them right now? You're making such fast progress on the most basic of basic exercises that I see no reason to include bands right now. If you're going to do so, it would have to be like one variation per lift. Because even then, if you increase the band tension too much, it's distorted for your current strength level. I'm not going to make you do strong band deadlifts, for example, or monster mini band bench presses. I would say micro bands are all you need in that case. So that's for the big compounds if you plan on mixing in, right? So this is me speaking in general terms here. Obviously, there are exceptions, like if you're an athlete, but for most people, they don't need bands right now for the compounds. If you're doing standard home workouts, get some bands. If you're doing bands as a replacement for cables, nothing wrong with that. Try some push downs, lap pull downs. It all depends what you're currently working with. But from a holistic standpoint, novices probably don't need them. So wait till you're an intermediate lifter. Once you've milked all the gains, hey, do all the variations you want. And that's when I started doing them as well. I think you should use bands when your strength level is appropriate for it. Hey Alex, do you recommend training arms three times a week for someone who is torso dominant and struggles to grow their arms? Thanks. Not necessarily. I would say twice a week is all you really need for maximum hypertrophy, especially if you're getting your 10 to 20 sets a week maximum for all the body parts, which includes arms. If you're doing that, I don't see why adding a third day would be that much more beneficial unless it's an arm day, but that you're going to do a full body workout three times a week and some curls and extensions at the end like you're still getting the same amount of volume and the evidence does not seem to be that strong right now that upping the frequency to more than twice a week is that much better from a muscle gaining perspective. For strength, it could be different, but for muscle gain, that's not really the case. So I don't think that having it spread out like that would make that much more of a difference. As long as you're getting consistently stronger on the isolation movements 
you're addressing your weaknesses, you have the goal to improve your arms, the frequency aspect probably matters less than you think. Unless we're talking about nucleus overload and other little strategies like that. So I would say if you're doing an arm day, it probably is beneficial. If you have the flexibility of the scheduling to allow for that, and it's not going to interfere with your recovery for other objectives. You know, like for me, I would not do an arm day right now because I feel it would hurt my bench press progression. I'd have to sacrifice a little bit of stuff. So I'm cool with just smashing the arms hard at the end of the workout, which I'm doing pretty good. But if you're not training like me, you don't have the same objectives, then yeah, throw in the arm day and you probably will get better results from doing that. So two solid upper body workouts, one arm day, I would say that's pretty solid. But just three regular workouts with isolation stone at the end, I don't see that being better unless it allows you to push yourself much harder. You're not gonna be lazy on your arms, which is often common with torso down and lifters. Hey Alex, would you recommend your novice program for women? I'm running and the results have been pretty solid. I wonder whether it'd be beneficial for my girlfriend too. You bet it would. Only thing is the gains will unquestionably be slower. That's the truth. So if you're able to add 10 pounds a week to your deadlift, your girlfriend might only be able to add five. That's normal. Their potential is also not as high as you. If you can milk the system for 12 months, maybe for her, only six. But again, that doesn't matter. That's just how it is. And at the end of the day, she's still gonna get excellent strength and muscle results. She'll look way better with this than some of the garbage routines that you see fitness influencers promoting, which just leaves women running around in circles, becoming cardio bunnies, not gaining any appreciable amount of musculature, which results in that skinny fat appearance because you do need to gain some muscle if you wanna get that toned look. That's really what it means. That's how most women will look their best. Resistance training. And focusing on the fundamental compound movements, which my novice program includes, the squat, bench press, overhead press, bar row, getting stronger at that will give your girlfriend what she's looking for and most women in general. So that definitely needs to be the foundation. Hey Alex, gyms are closed here in Italy. My home bar is one of those cheap and thin ones with no knurling. Right now I'm still weak. I did a 300 mix grip with no issues on that bar. That's pretty good, man, if it's a smooth bar like that. But I'm wondering if the smoothness of the bar could still be limiting me from lifting more, even if I can hold the weight of my hands, show you straps, or can I just keep using bare lifted until my grip can't keep up? Thanks for bringing up the weekly Q and A's. You're strong enough right now to handle the thinness and lack of knurling. That's extremely commendable. I would say that if you had a proper power bar, your deadlift would likely be above 300 pounds. Heck, you might be pretty darn close to intermediate already. The fact that you're lifting with such subpar conditions is extremely impressive. So I would say in your case, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. It's not slipping out yet, so don't go down that path. But by the time you hit, say, 365, it's just impossible to grip onto, then don't listen to any of the dogmatic assholes on this platform who are gonna tell you, hey, just keep gripping it with the mix. They're not in your position. A lot of these guys have nice barbells. They go to great gyms. They don't know or understand your struggle. I've been there. I get it. I used to go to a gym and these bars felt like glass. The moment I got my freaking Westside Power Bar, my hands were getting torn up. But guess what? No more grip issues. So I stopped using the straps at home. But when I would go to a gym, I had literally had no choice. It wasn't a grip issue. It would just slip out because there was nothing to grip onto. And... They were so cheap that they were rolling my hands constantly. I bet you're having that problem as well without even realizing it. Maybe at some point you'll notice it, but right now, you're okay. So if grip is becoming a limiting issue, but it's not your fault. It's not the fault of your forearm. It's not the fact that you can't grip it. It's literally the barbell because it's so cheap and defective, quote unquote. Why would you ever let that limit the gains of your posterior chain and your back in general? Makes no sense. Use straps when the time is right. What do you think about one arm calisthenics moves plus bulking? I want to build strength and mass, and I was wondering if this is effective with the gyms closed and all. It's more than effective. I've made so many videos talking about calisthenics that I'm not even going to go there. And if you're bulking up while doing this, you become heavier such that it's like wearing a weighted vest at all times. So it's good from a muscle gaining perspective. For learning certain skills, probably not. But keep this in mind. If you gain 20 pounds while improving on all your basic calisthenics and you cut back, you will be able to skip several steps for whatever skill you were trying to learn. So if you're trying to do one arm pull-ups and you're so close to locking out, then you drop the weight, guess what? Now you have it, achievement unlocked instantly. So weighted calisthenics is a secret way of granting instant carryover, just that. 
it's not the optimal state to be in when you're trying to display your performance. And that's why these guys tend to be on the leaner side. So that would probably be the best thing to do, maintain a lean weight and gradually work on the progressions. But if you want to say, screw all that, let's just focus on getting swole, do the high reps, do the, the foundations, and then, you know, cut back when necessary. I don't have a problem with that. In regards to doing one arm moves, I'm not really a fan for most exercises with the exception of the one arm pull up. I find that the push ups results in a lot of body twisting. And I rarely see people who could do it with good form, like actual clean, squared off torso. It always ends up looking ugly. And I just don't like that. It's less of a consistent movement. Same thing if you're doing one arm extensions, like who the f is actually doing that in their training? Or one arm rows, those are really hard to do. Not saying they're impossible, but most of the unilateral exercises just don't make the most amount of sense if you're doing it with your straight body weight. If you add in a band, then now you're able to get some classic, you know, bodybuilding sets and reps. You can get your three sets of eight to 12. But if you're only able to do three reps, then you're trash for the rest of the workout, then that doesn't really make the most amount of sense to me. If it starts to feel like an actual skill. And that's what you're gonna see with the majority of these one-arm moves. Just take the one-arm pull-up. If you're only able to do one rep, that's literally a one rep max. So how do you wanna maximize your results? You can't, unless you put on some serious band tension and now you're doing the one-arm pull-ups for decent repetitions. So that's where it would make sense. If you're actually able to employ the bodybuilding strategies. Otherwise, stick to two arms and just make the variations harder, man. Like pseudo planche push-ups. Do those instead of one-arm push-ups. Do deficit handstand push-ups. Don't try to do a, a, a one-arm handstand push-up. It's probably not gonna happen. So with calisthenics, we could talk about hypotheticals, but at the end of the day, feasibility matters most. Hey Alex, when you do weighted pull-ups, should you do the hollow body form the way calisthenics movement demonstrates or an arch back? I feel that like my leverages suck on heavy weighted pull-ups if I don't engage my abs, hollow body form. I would say do both. And actually calisthenics movement made a really good video on that topic where he compares both. But in my opinion, when you do really heavy weighted pull-ups, you can't maintain the posterior pelvic tilt with the perfect hollow body. It's not going to happen. Strap on over three plates, try doing it for reps with that form. Most of you will not be able to do it, even though your upper back might be able. That's entirely possible. But the form is just less feasible. I'm telling you how it is, guys, especially if you're doing with the loading pin. You're going to feel your hip flexes so much that it doesn't even make sense at that point. I would say just pull with the form that allows you to get over the bar while maintaining some degree of strictness, but it need not be perfect. The perfection that you see out there mostly applies to lighter weights. If you're repping out a plate, okay, keep it super clean. But after a certain point, you just got to get brutally strong. And that's my sincere opinion. And it's so what we see with those who are competing and getting some hardcore numbers in there. Are close grip floor presses and close grip overhead presses, either with a Swiss bar or tricep bar, worse for the elbows than using a standard grip? I used a tricep bar for these two movements of the other day to mix things up. And afterwards, I suddenly noticed some pretty bad pain in my right elbow that stopped me from doing tricep extensions on that day. Okay. I would say those really close grips can absolutely be more stressful on the elbows. It's why you don't see guys recommending that on the regular close grip bench. That tends to be more so bodybuilding advice. You see my Swiss bar over there? That close grip is far too narrow. I don't do presses like that because even with me, it doesn't feel the best on the shoulders or the elbows while also compromising the range of motion. So it does come a point where, yeah, you're too close. And most people who do close grip work should either be a little bit inside shoulder width apart or directly at it. You don't have to be like this. So if your elbows are at this angle here, basically they're less aligned, yeah, you're probably gonna have more elbow pain, especially if you're trying to aggressively tuck them in. Not to mention the extra stress on the wrist. So you wanna keep things more stacked up, more aligned. And that's gonna be literally your shoulder width, you go a little bit more in. Try two fingers in the smooths on the regular barbell, then go over to your Swiss bar and see what that correlates to. And I guarantee you that the moment you do that, there's gonna be no pain. Sometimes the variations can indeed be harder but for the wrong reasons. You're putting stress that should not be there. It's like saying, hey, do a super wide grip overhead press because you're way weaker at it. It's gonna give you some variation. Or a guillotine bench press. That's true. You are absolutely overcoming the law of accommodation with that approach. But it's for the wrong reason. You're destroying your body in the process, so don't freaking do it. I would say the same thing in this case. If it's hurting your elbows, it's not for you. That's all. Do you need to squat? To increase the conventional deadlift. I mean, you need big quads. 
you don't need to squat to increase your conventional deadlift. Just like you don't need to do the conventional deadlift to get better at the conventional deadlift. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do this though. So when we talk about needing versus what is optimal, that's where we got to draw the line, right? What I would say is you have a lot of elite deadlifters with poor squats. You're talking to one of them. I've been one of the laziest squatters in the history of YouTube fitness for a guy who puts up these numbers with this level of musculature. I still have an elite deadlift according to EXRX charts. And, you know, pretty strong pound for pound in general. I barely did squats to get to that point. Years back, I used to specialize in them. But when I was at my highest level of performance, I wasn't doing squats. What did I do? A lot of hip hinges, which is what a deadlift is. I developed my posterior chain so much that I had a great pull, as well as my upper back and my forearms and all that. Does that mean that was optimal? No, far from it. And that's why I'm always going to recommend, yes, you should squat if you want to improve your deadlift, especially box squat. But to say that you need to squat to build a great pull is a lie. Many lifters have disproven that time and time again. Heck, if you did nothing but good mornings, you have a good conventional deadlift if you're addressing all the correct muscles in general. But small quads will always limit your deadlift because you still need them to pull heavy weights. Your size potential will limit your strength potential. If your leg drive is not maximized, your conventional deadlift will also not be maximized. So I wouldn't neglect your quads if you actually care about being the best at this. Using one arm chin up, one arm pull up variations that I can only do singles on for three by one and 90% for ME substitutes since I don't have access to adequate weights for one or max intensity weighted pull ups. Also using a pause, a variation, and three week waves and calisthenics concurrent for intermediate to milk a bit longer. Okay, all that stuff is fine. I'm not going to comment on it. Keep doing that, okay? In regards to the three sets of 190%, yes, if it indeed is that percentage, you're going to get brutally strong. It will act as a weighted pull up substitute. So for those who are able to do this, let's say week one, chin up, week two, pull up, week three, wide neutral, then week four, one arm pull up for either a one or max or three sets of 190%. Yeah, if it actually is the correct percentages, this is legit stuff. The velocity has slowed down. It's close to 100%. Why would you not get similar benefits to doing weighted pull ups? It doesn't matter what the variation is. Straining is straining. It would be like asking, hey, Alex, what if I do three sets of 190% on a lunge? It's a unilateral exercise, but it's not me squatting. So would that still provide the max effort benefits? Yes, it would. Just that there'd be more of a stability factor in that case. But with the one arm pull up, I'd argue there's more brute force involved. You can say there's somewhat of a technique component, but at the end of the day, you're either strong enough to do it or you're not. So I don't feel like stability would necessarily limit you in that way. Like I used to believe in the past, but now it's like, yeah, if you're able to do them, you're straining hard enough for sure. Hey Alex, do you know any band exercises that strengthen the connective tissue for shoulder pain? I have this sharp soreness in my anterior delta the day after benching and weighted dips. You need to find out what the cause is for that man because it's a red flag and snap steady weights if you don't fix this. Your shoulders should not feel beat down the day after benching or doing dips. Otherwise, there's some overuse that's coming in or maybe using the, the wrong form or the wrong variations. You got to really analyze your system, okay? Because what I'm going to share with you will help, but it's not correcting the root cause. You're just putting a bandaid over it. So what helps with the connective tissue? Check out Donnie Thompson's shoulder protocol. It's a mobility routine that can be used for those who have achy shoulders. I used to do this before my benching sessions because I'm putting up such numbers that Injury prevention needs to be at the back of my mind. So even though I may not be getting pain, I still want to prevent it from happening. I don't do this all the time. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. But that's one thing you could try out. In regards to other exercises, the main thing is going to be focusing on external rotation. And I recommend you do this with a band because of the resistance profile. Just doing what a dumbbell, like you know when you see guys grabbing two dumbbells and they do this, it's not doing anything because of the direction of resistance. So do it with a cable or a band opening up. Also, pull aparts are extremely important. And one way that I found, which is really effective is you put it in the back of the power rack like this and just open up. I feel like you can really put on some heavy tension and the muscles light up like crazy. So definitely recommend pull aparts and dislocations. 
So these are the most basic movements around, but they work. Additionally, I would recommend hangs on a puller bar to get rid of some of that impingement, get some opening up. Oh, and of course, you better be doing your band face pulls. High reps, same strategies as the band push downs when you have elbow pain. Do you think underhand versus overhand rows would be better to target bicep growth? Also, if doing deadlift rack pulls, should one do underhand since it hits lats more? In regards to your question, no, you should absolutely not do that since the risk of tearing your bicep is far greater. You don't want to mess around with this, even if theoretically you can hit the lats slightly harder, which I don't even believe is correct in that case. In this instance, way to stretch is occurring. That is what will develop your lats and not even to the best degree anyway. We've seen many great pullers who have worse lats than those who specialize in weighted pull-ups. I would say your average calisthenics athlete looks wider than your average, say, five, 600 pound deadlift. Unless that individual who got to a high pull did additional exercise. But for the minimalists who just get a strong deadlift and that's it, pray to the Lord that everything's gonna be fine. I don't really see the most amount of width compared to those who do full range of motion pulls like barbell rows, weighted pull-ups, stuff like that. Sometimes when you see a guy with a big pull, you would assume, oh, it's the deadlift itself that got them the, the wide back. But usually it's the movements that built the deadlift that got them those gains. So it's a false correlation that we often see in this fitness community, especially by powerlifters. But that's a different topic altogether. Since you're not pulling through the full range of motion, I think you should use the neutral grip like in the trap bar or overhand. Don't be wasting your time with underhand deadlifts because your biceps, if you end up bending your arm to a certain extent, you're gonna tear your bicep. And that happens a lot. So in regards to the rows, yeah, that's fine because now we're dealing with somewhat manageable weights. But even then, if you're going to do some cheat rows, I would not do the underhand grip. You can make the argument that you strengthen the tendons and ligaments. But still, why go down that path with overloading weights? If you're doing it strictly, you'll be okay. And I would say that for some torso down and lifters, the extra bicep engagement could indeed be beneficial. Maybe not by a huge margin, but if you're getting that extra 15% edge, maybe 20 at the max, I would still find it worth it. If you're doing three rows in a session, two could be underhand, one overhand. Or if you're really concerned, two overhand, one underhand. At the end of the day, it's not gonna be a deal breaker. We're just adding on to the effect slightly more. What matters most is getting stronger at your curls. Can I get the same results if I bulk on a whole food plant-based diet versus your average dirty bulk? The average dirty bulk is horrific. Some people don't even hit their optimal micronutrients. They just stuff their food with all kinds of junk. Might be good on the protein and the calories, but everything else is subpar. And they have so much inflammation that they don't feel the best. They're in a constant state of bloat. Their work capacity goes to hell. They tend to drop their cardio as well since they can't even complete the workout because they're so out of breath. Ideally, you should be in a small surplus eating the same foods that you normally eat. Maybe with some junk thrown in there as well. If you want to, you don't care about additional fat gain, but that you're just going to scrap everything. Yeah, let's just eat whatever the fuck I want. That's not better than a cleaner diet that still pays attention to macros, micros, the different foods that you're ingesting. That's obviously the way to do things for the best of the best gains. So on a whole food plant-based diet where you're minimizing inflammation to the absolute max, you're eating the best foods on the planet, how do you think you're gonna feel? Like a million bucks. And you're gonna be so full since you get all this food in without the additional calories. That might be good or bad for some people. If you're a hard gainer, which is really someone who has a small appetite, maybe it's gonna be worse. So in that case, I would include some liquid meals to go with it. But for most individuals, like this is smarter. It's, it's a better option for your long-term health. It's what you probably should do. And you know, you're gonna get a surplus of everything. All right guys, final question of the week. How do you personally set realistic goals for yourself in terms of strength? Do you go through a certain algorithm to set yourself that goal? It's all experience based. Once you've been in the game for so many years, you know your body, you know what you can expect to gain on a monthly basis and yearly basis. You've seen the patterns over the years. You're no longer a novice lifter where things are rather uncertain. At that point, you don't know what your potential is like. You're just figuring out what moments work for you. And the progression is heightened to a point that you will never experience ever again throughout your entire lifting career. So when I see novices complaining, it's like it blows my mind because this is literally the best time, right? So you don't know what you're capable of doing right now. That's why like, stop worrying about your genetics, just be the best version of you, right? 
once you've been training for years, you know what needs to be addressed. And that's where intelligent programming becomes in the play, right? So a novice can take his deadlift from 135 to 45 in a year. Think about how much that is. Have you ever heard of any natural advanced lifter adding that much to their pull? So once you're at a certain level and you're gaining minuscule amounts of muscle year after year, what do you think that does to your strength gains? It's the same thing. So in my case, I set a 180, 185 pull-up. I want fourth place. My current max is 165. It's not a huge jump here. I set a 405 bench goal. Why do I think I can pull that off? Because I did 385 in 2020. So I think 20 pounds is realistic, considering the fact that my 385 probably was not a 100% true effort. I think I could have maybe hit 390, and I've done 395 touch and go in the past. So I was like, okay, 405, it's four plates. I'm going to gain a bit of weight in the process. I'm training like an absolute madman. I got a whole year. I'm already somewhat close to it. It's somewhat realistic. And if I don't get it, well, hey, at least I'll be close to it, right? So you know what your body's like. The trends show up. You can see it clear as day, especially if you have workout logs, especially if you film your stuff. That's why you guys definitely got to get an Instagram account. Follow me as well, by the way, for some motivation. But get an IG, film for you, not for followers. Heck, you can be private. Don't do it for validation. Do it for you. Log your stuff. And you'll find after a certain point that, hey, I typically add, say, 15 pounds a year to my bench. I typically add 30 pounds to my squat or deadlift. You just know. It's not hard to be realistic when you've been in this game for a decade or more. It's so obvious. And that's why a lot of guys are confused because they haven't hit that stage yet. They haven't paid their dues, per se. They're in the process of doing that. If they stay committed, they will reap what they sow. But it's usually beginners who have trouble setting goals not elite lifters. So that's all there is to it. It's experience-based. And hey, if I overshoot a little bit and I don't get to my required goal, so be it. I don't really care. I'm in this game for life. So whether I get the goal this year or the next year, so what? At least I'm setting high standards for myself and not giving up. And you should do the same thing. Elevate. Learn more about proper programming. Learn your body. And obviously, be realistic. But of course, realize you're capable of more. So that's it, guys. Hope you enjoyed this Q&A. If you got more questions, post them down below. And I'll see you in the next one.